Welcome to Fort Fritz, your one stop for news, current events, and all forms of entertainment relating to the paranormal, the supernatural, the 14, and things that go whoo, bump in the night, all packaged and presented in the form of Know Nothing, Know It Alls, entertaining the unknown. Hello, my name is Fritz. I will be your host for the next hour, and let's kick it off and get right to things, shall we? It's Halloween weekend for a lot of people, having those Halloween parties. So we are presenting our scariest stories, and we start off with Man Daddy's story on Roland T. Owen and Room 1046. Just download that iHeartRadio app, search Fort Fritz, and you will find this on the Fort Fritz Campfire Tales channel. Enjoy. But it just this reminds me about uh, a bit of an interesting unsolved murder. Have you ever heard of the... uh the murder of Roland T. Owen? No, I have not. Roland T. Owen? Yeah, Roland T. Owen. Very sing songy name. I was going to say, sounds like a country song. Roland right? T. Owen, dying in the hotel. Look at him dead, look at him dead, he'll probably never die again. Of all the unsolved murders in the U.S., the murder of Roland T. Owen is certainly one of them. On Wednesday, January 2nd, 1935, a man who identified himself as Roland T. Owen checked into the Hotel President in Kansas City and never checked out. Now, when he showed up, he had no luggage, no other clothing, no items at all except basically what he was wearing and a few things he was carrying. Now, according to a bellhop, all he had was a brush, a comb, and toothpaste with him. They checked him in, and Roland was checked into room... 1046 or 1046. Later that day, a maid came to clean the room and she found Owen sitting alone in the room with just a small lamp lighting the room with the shades drawn. Later she said that he always liked to keep it dark. Always liked the room dark. Kind of like the Genesis song. Oh, keep it dark. That's one of my favorite Genesis songs. Such a great song. Now, he told her to leave the room unlocked because he's expecting a guest later. And then Owen left the room. The maid said that he appeared to be nervous and frightened, kind of agitated by something going on. Four hours later, she returned with clean towels. She found the room still unlocked from earlier, and she entered, feeling that he probably wasn't there, and found Owen laying fully clothed on the top of the still-made bed, asleep. And there was a note on the bedstand that read, Don, I will be back in 15 minutes. Wait. He didn't say like 917. No, right? just a note that said, Don, I'll be back in 15 minutes. Wait. And he's sitting there laying there completely clothed on top of the sheets. Now that night, around 11 p.m., a man named Robert Lane was driving home when he was flagged down by a man wearing just an undershirt and slacks and no coat despite the cold. Robert noticed that the man had a deep scratch on his arm. He said, you look as if you've been in it bad. Robert said, the man responded, I'll kill that blank tomorrow. The newspaper that reported this omitted the expletive. Lane, the man, Robert Lane, drove the man to a taxi stand. And later, when uh, when questioned, he would identify the man as Roland T. Owen. He gave this felty ass a ride after. He's like, I'll kill whoever. He's like, 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 okay, I'm just going to take you to the taxi stand and get out of my car as quickly as possible. I would have been like, dude, get out of here. You know when? Maybe he was like, maybe he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. (laughs) Who are we talking about? (laughs) Yeah, we could do this tonight. The next day, at 10.30 a.m., the same maid returned to clean the room. This time, she found the door locked from the outside. Oh, no. As if the guest had left and locked the door. So she assumed that Roland was out, used her passkey, and entered the room. This maid, she assumed she can go in if it's open. She assumed she can go in if it's locked. That's what maids do, dude. Have you ever been to a hotel? I guess. They'll walk right in you. like, lady, chill. (laughs) So she enters the room, and there again is Owen sitting on the bed with the lights out. Meaning that someone had locked him in the room because it was locked in the outside. So he's just sitting there in the lights waiting for whatever's going to happen. So he was awake, let her clean up the room. While she was cleaning the room, he got a phone call. That is really eerie. So he takes a phone call while she's cleaning and he says over the phone, No, no, Don, I don't want to eat. I just had breakfast. No, I am not hungry. And he hung up the phone. Now, later the same day, the maid returned with more towels. 
This chick is really into towels. This woman is extreme. Like she's sleuthing. I feel like she understands yeah, something. And up. towels are her excuse. She has the exact like phrasing of the conversation, phone call conversation. The rest of of her floor is like, I received no towels. <laughs> I haven't she's had a just towel buzzing around this one dude's room. Now she knocked on the door, but this time she heard two voices in the room. When she said she had towels, a deep, rough voice told her, "Leave. We have enough towels." Though she knew they had none because she had just taken all the dirty towels earlier and was bringing back clean ones. So she's like, you definitely don't have enough towels. I have all the towels. Why don't you need more towels? That night, other guests on the 10th floor complained about hearing loud voices coming from the room, both male and female. The next morning, the hotel operator knows that Owen's phone had been knocked off the hook for a while. So a bellboy was sent to check on Roland to see if he's okay. Then the bellboy noticed a do not disturb sign on the door. And so, knocked anyway. They always do. He heard a low voice respond. Come in. No, 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 no. Turn on the lights. But the door was locked and no one responded. He knocked a few more times and no one responded. So he just yelled, hey, put the phone back on the hook, okay? And left. He's like, okay, I don't like this. He felt creeped out. He went back. Almost two hours later, the phone was still off the hook. So they sent another bellboy, and he used his passkey and entered the room. The room was completely dark this time. This is the badass bellboy. The room was dark, but by the light of the hallway, he could see Roland laying naked on the bed face first and the phone on the floor near the bed stand. So the bellboy, assuming that Roland was just drunk, right at the table, put the phone on the hook, and backed out of the room. He later stated that he noticed that the bedding around Owen was darkened. Around 10.45 a.m., the phone was off the hook again. Even after being righted, all of a sudden, it's off the hook again. The third bellboy (laughs) is set to fix the issue, but was met with a very, very different scene. He stated, quote, When I entered the room, this man was within two feet of the door on his knees and elbows, holding his head in his hands. I noticed the blood on his head. Then I turned the light on. I looked around and saw blood on the wall. Blood on the bed and in the bathroom. This frightened me, and I immediately left the room and went downstairs. Police and an ambulance were sent to the scene immediately. Amazingly, when they arrived, Owen was still somewhat alive. When asked if anyone else had been in the room, he responded, Nobody. Then he claimed he fell and hit his head on the bathtub, which is completely reasonable because uh, they later noticed that he'd been tied up with a cord around his neck and wrists and ankles, had a fractured skull, and been stabbed in the chest several times and had a punctured lung. So that always happens when you slip and hit your head on a you know, bathtub. Stab- so the doctor said that the injuries happened six to seven hours ago, meaning that he was bleeding out when the second bellboy arrived. That was blood in the bed, and he was laying there bleeding out. So there's some theories that... He kept on just trying to reach for the phone in mid-consciousness and knocking it over and not be able to dial for help and just crawling off the bed and just barely living and then eventually, you know, dying. So, yeah, he died that night, January 5th, at the hospital. Detectives found no weapon and none of Owen's belongings in the room, even the small amount of things he brought, none of it, none of his clothes, not even his coat, his uh, brush, all that, gone. All they found was a hairpin, an unlit cigarette, and four small fingerprints on the phone Mm. that they suspected were female. Now, they researched into his name, and they could find nowhere a record of anyone with that name. Either there, he said to the bellboy that he was in, uh, that he was from Los Angeles. They checked there, could find nothing. No one could ever come find that name anywhere. False name. So his body was even put on display, and photos were sent to newspapers saying, do you know this man to no avail? So his body was about to be buried in a potter's field when the funeral home received an anonymous call saying that they would send money for a proper funeral. And a few days later, cash arrived wrapped in a newspaper. Anonymous flowers were also sent with a card that said, Love Forever, Louise. Now about a year and a half later, a woman named Ruby finally identified the man as her son, whose name was Artemis Ogletree. Yeah. Artemis Ogletree, dude. That's a great name. That is amazing. If he's not a drummer or like... Uh, like a badass a, hitman? Either one. Either one. So, and at the time of his death, he was only 17. According to Ruby. 
Really? Yeah. Yes. And she also reported that she had received three letters from her son after he had died in that hotel room because she didn't know he was dead. And uh, was, with a month after his death, she received three different letters and they were all typed, which he never typed and didn't even know how to type and used slang and terminology that was completely unfamiliar to Artemis. And so that always confused her. And now it seemed like she had an idea that, okay, these weren't from him because of the whole death thing. So throughout the years, there have been other bits and pieces of clues. There's been a lot of possibilities of tied to um, him cheating on a woman and then the jilted lover uh, uh, coming and the both of them killing him. There's uh, mob connections with him staying at other hotels nearby with other men. And so there's it's but none of it has ever been able to tie the whole thing down throughout the years. There have been bits and pieces of clues, but nothing ever comes close to explaining how or why the horrors of room 1046 happened. You're listening to Fort Fritz right here on Real Radio 104.1. Fort Fritz on Real Radio 104.1. Welcome back to Fort Fritz right here on Real Radio 104.1. I'm your host, Fritz. Sometimes the dead can talk. What? I'm talking about the Jefferson Davis 8 murders. This one uh, presented by yours truly, and it actually is the basis for the True Detective HBO series. Just download that iHeartRadio app if you would like more spooky campfire tales. Search Fort Fritz Campfire Tales. This is the Jeff Davis 8 Murders. You guys ever heard of the Jeff Davis 8? Sounds like a kind of a prog rock thing. Or yeah, kind of, you know, progressive jazzy I sort of thing. Like Actually, you're right. That does sound a like that. shuffle beat going on mm-hmm. into some, you know, some Moog keyboards. Like I can, a way lamer it. Chicago. Here's a bit of a warning from Fort Fritz. Uh, this story deals with sexually explicit crimes against women, especially people in powerless positions. So uh, listener discretion is advised as we deal with this very sensitive subject. Um, per the Rolling Stone article I'm basing the story on, I feel compelled to go ahead and use their opening sentence because it's awesome. It's going to set the tone for this entire story. Quote, The details of the Jeff Davis eight murders are so incredible and so quintessentially by you that if they were fiction, (laughs) they'd seem a little heavy handed, unquote. And I always like to say if something doesn't smell right, but it's the absolute truth. I, I like to say if you wrote this and handed it to Hollywood, they would have you rewrite it and say not believable. Wow. Nice. So I was like, ooh, that's really good. Quintessential Bayou. Yeah. This all goes down. Local police, this was from 2005 to 2019, were disturbed, but not too much, and I will get into that later, by the disappearance and murders of multiple victims, all women, all of whom worked in the solicitation and prostitution trade. Each woman came from a poor background. They were destitute or they had uh, criminal histories. They lived in the, in the wrong part of town, so to speak. Um, their criminal histories were uh, petty violations, petty theft, to like hardcore substance abuse, like caught with multiple grams of a Schedule One. I don't really know, but probably not marijuana. They were all from South Jennings, which was not the best part of town. And they were all killed in various manners. Some were strangled. Some were probably given hot shots of, uh, you know, mixed drugs. What's a hot shot? A hot shot is like way too much heroin, way too much cocaine, all in one shot. It's like right in, OD shot? Yeah, exactly. Like right into the blood-brain barrier, and it's going to shut everything down. Ethan Brown was the author and private investigator who initially garnered attention for this story. He did this through a New York Times story he published in 2010. But he was responsible for blowing this up on the national level. He goes on to state, quote, all eight of the victims snitched for local law enforcement about the Jennings drug trade. So they were informants. Jennings is, I don't want to say parish because they say Jefferson Davis parish. And Jefferson Davis, anyone know who he was? President. Of what? The The the, the, the Tennessee. There you go. This uh, case is still unsolved to this day. Without any specific story in mind. Ethan Brown traveled to Louisiana to talk with the local population just to see what he could find. He had, I guess, several weeks off, or maybe he... Got some PTO stored up. He's like, hey, I'm going to go solve eight murders in the bayou. (laughs) (laughs) As a lark. I like that. Or for a laugh. But what he found immediately was suspect at best. He befriended a drug dealer known as Bowlegs. Oh, yeah. Bowlegs. Nice. Bowlegs. Bowlegs, yeah. Who earned that nickname after receiving... 
a shotgun blast to the legs. <laughs> nice. Fun. He dated two of the eventual eight victims. And curiously, was found dead the very next day after really? Mr. Brown interviewed him. Oh. oh, well, interesting. He drove to the crime scene. He was shocked by what he saw. Bowlegs had been shot to death in his home. There was no established perimeter, duly noted by officials, no no crime scene, with bystanders just freely f***ing about through the residence. <laughs> just wandering about, checking it out. Trampling on the crime scene. This is Bolex's place, huh? Like, where is he? Some, <laughs> some even taking murderabilia with him. Yeah, like, oh, pouring out the oh, beer. what? Over the blood gum. Bolex! This is for you, <laughs> my you baby. Quick quiz. Does this sound like a police force that has any idea what's going on? Uh, it seems How like much they're letting it be corrupted. Yeah. For multiple years, he uh, Ethan Brown is traveling down there, repeated trips. He's questioning those who are personally private and intimately involved with these victims. And then thanks to the Louisiana Open Public Records, I guess they have one of the best in the entire world as far as what you can like uh, request access to. Transparency. He acquired a boatload of evidence, thousands of different files. Many of the reports named the now-defunct Boudreaux Inn... And that was a hotel, like a headquarters for pimps and prostitutes to score drugs and johns for the night. Rampant misconduct and very early on concluded the obvious. This was not a serial killing, but instead an investigation so poorly handled it was criminal in the fact that it was just rotting. Around this time, Brown was surprised to see a trailer for a new HBO show set in Louisiana based around unsolved murders. Oh. So he titled his story, Who Killed the Jeff Davis 8? With the subtitle, An Investigation into a Real-Life Capital True Capital Detective Case. Oh, wow. Brilliantly done. He published that in the New York Times. It was a very, very small article. A book deal soon followed. Ah, boom. Nice to done, things, It's all timing. Yeah, right? Here's where things get dumb. Sheriff <laughs> Ivy Woods of the Jefferson Davis Parish published a memo that reads like a character assassination of Mr. Brown. In the memo, he says, quote, Kaz was right. That was not in quotes. He re- resents Kaz? <laughs> I resent out-of-town journalist trying to paint our parish with a broad brush that insinuates we are corrupt, unquote. Kaz was absolutely right. And also, this confusing line, quote, it is unfortunate out-of-town journalists are taking information and twisting it to support a fictional conspiracy theory to gain followers and sell a story, unquote. Oh, yeah. People always like accuse people of that. It, just at the end, he adds fame and fortune. You think he's doing this for f- fame and fortune? Yeah. He interviewed someone who died the next day, yeah. right. who dated two of the eight victims. Mm-hmm. That, to me, is just really stupid. From, <laughs> from the desk of Sheriff Woods... And that's jdpso.org, jdpso.org. The local Jennings newspaper, who was Mr. Brown's ally for most of his research, did a 180 and roasted him in the press, publishing attacks against him. But the paper wouldn't return emails. They wouldn't return calls. And one of his allies at the, the press team confided in a professional and friendly way his book would never be published. So why is an author going down here, finding the story out, and no one is returning his calls? Because of the Louisiana Public Records file, he was actually able to find out who owned the Boudreaux Inn. The Boudreaux Inn was operated by people in high-ranking political circles, specifically Congressman Charles Bostony. His name was brought up in several conversations. So through this um, inquest, Brown found that Martin P. Goolery, Goolery. Um, a representative for uh, Boston, he was listed as the co-owner. Now, he's not saying they had anything to do with this, but these two high-ranking politicians owned a hotel that was always brought up when these eight murders happened, and the police chief isn't doing Jack. from an outsider's perspective. Sure, right? But, yeah, I don't know. Well, he's also, like, penning these, like, snarky op-eds in the... Yeah, I would be the best arch villain of all time because I would shut my House, mouth. Right. I wouldn't like be, get in the newspaper and be like, well, you out of town newspaper. Like, hey, we're supporting the investigation in any way we can. We're going to help him out. 
Uh, please continue to check it out. And then you kill him, like, and on the side. And, you know, his car veers off the road or something. Like, like Gus yeah. in Breaking Bad. It's, sure. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's the chill, most bizarre be cool. thing. Yeah. yeah. Just, just if you're just innocent. Act just like you've been here, be man. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> act, like, act like this isn't your first rodeo. <laughs> just to clarify, um, he does not... He concludes by saying he doesn't know what happened. Again, Louisiana, and props to Louisiana. Like I've never, I've never ever said that, and will ever say it again. <laughs> I've, I've never Doom heard that. Doom and for the future of Louisiana. And my Louis- I've Louis- never said that. I can't believe I just did. Oh my god! Yeah, never again. <laughs> I felt really dirty. But um, Louisiana, I, if they have these really awesome public access records, why didn't the police? note that in any kind of report they didn't look like they had any kind of nefarious background so they were used as pawns they could all be blackmailed they all had a prior criminal record so they were pawns so they decided to become police informants how old were they do you get the age range varying from 24 to 36 okay but um do you think that i think i think actually the youngest was 19 wow so do you think that the police were involved in covering up the crimes? Do you think the police were involved with the prostitution side of things? Or do you think it was just a big, heady mess of crap? I don't think anything like that can be even talked about. Because I feel like Ethan Brown's life would be put at stake. I, I think that's why True Detective <sighs> literally didn't... They sidestepped the issue at all of hmm. what of who actually was the bad guy. Can they we- made it this nebulous society. Right. I'm not even going to say, because if I say something, the the pro-police fans that we have, and they're out there every day, mm-hmm. that's not my fight. You might come after me, or the anti-police crowd might come after me, or the pro-military, anti-military, or the journalists suck, uh, fake news, free speech. It's like, you can't even comment on this. It's just something that happened, and it probably smells so there probably is corruption. A lot of smoke. Right. But he published a book and he had no answers in it. The and I, that I think that's fascinating. There was a high-ranking government yeah. official who was, uh, let's not call it the proprietor, but like had ties to this straight-up pit motel. Like you said, starts to stink a little bit. It's also really easy to say in the case of Bowlegs, who was killed in his home, uh, when we got there, it was already a contaminated crime scene. We couldn't do further investigation. Remember, he got there and that's what he saw. Now all of these files are all over the place. Thank you. Hey, we were trying to more Fort Fritz in just a few minutes on Real Radio 104.1. Fort Fritz on Real Radio 104.1. Welcome back to Fort Fritz. We are uh, telling our spookiest Halloween stories for you right now. And uh, what's scarier than airplanes and the fear that goes along with airplanes? Say no more. Well, let's just listen to the crash of Japan Airlines Flight 123, presented by Angela on our Fort Fritz Campfire Tales channel on the iHeartRadio app. Oh, things. You have to follow the rules. Oh. Bad things can happen. Like have you guys what? ever heard of JAL 123? Sounds like a curse. Sounds Somali like the Macarena. Yeah. This is a funny... Is it, is it horrible? It's terrible. Oh, Damn it. Awful. Is it terrible? It's terrible. Oh, Damn it. Awful. Every time. Japan Airlines Flight 123, or JL-123, experienced in-flight structural failure that resulted in a very deadly crash on August 12th, 1985. But what exactly happened that day to cause this crash? Well, it's actually what happened years before. The aircraft was involved in a tail strike incident in Osaka International Airport seven years earlier. And a tail strike is when a plane is either taking off or landing and it comes into steep and all the weight breaks the back of the tail. Terrifying. Yes. So it damages the aircraft's rear pressure bulkhead. That's what that's called. But the repair, they actually didn't do correctly. It did not conform to Boeing's approved repair methods. Seems like rear pressure bulkhead. You need that. One would hope. I would hope, yeah. So for reinforcing a damaged bulkhead, the correct way, it calls for one continuous splice plate with three rows of rivets. But they did actually two instead of one continuous, so that actually compromised the bulkhead. That's more stress possibilities. Correct. So it actually reduced the parts resistance to fatigue cracking to about 70%. Ooh. Uh, This aircraft was a Boeing 747, and it was on the fifth of its sixth planned flights for that day. There were 15 crew members, including three cockpit crew and 12 flight attendants. In command was Captain Takahama Masami. 
and he was age 49, and he was a veteran. He had logged about 12,400 total flight hours, and almost 5,000 of those were accumulated flying 747s. So the guy knew his plane. He knew what he was doing. Um, but he was actually first officer that day because he was supervising um, the captain of the flight that day, which was first officer Yutaka Sasaki. He had about 4,000 total flight hours and about just under 3,000 of those hours were in 747s. Is that a Boeing 747? A, a 747 146SR, which is short range because it was just flying within the country. And then you also have flight engineer Fukuda Hiroshi, a veteran flight engineer, and he had about 9,800 total flight hours. So, so these guys were extremely uh, experienced. These are not noobs. Correct. Over 20,000, easy. Yes. Over 20,000 combined flight hours. After more than an hour on the ramp, Flight 123 pushed back from Gate 18 at 6.04 p.m. and took off from runway at Haneda Airport in Tokyo, Japan, at 6.12. 12 12 minutes behind schedule. 12, 12. 12, 12. And about 12 minutes after takeoff, cruising altitude over Sagami Bay, the aircraft's aft pressure bulkhead burst open. Son of a bitch. Due to that pre-existing defect that was incorrectly repaired from seven years before, that tail strike accident. This took seven years to break. Seven years to break. Which actually, you have to say, I mean, you think about how many flights a plane takes. This was its fifth out of six flights this plane was taking just that day. That day, right. So once that aft pressure bulk had burst, uh, this caused a rapid decompression of the aircraft Bringing down the ceiling around the rear lavatories, damaging the unpressurized fuselage aft of the bulkhead, unseating the vertical stabilizer. Does this mean anything to anybody? And severing all four hydraulic lines. So it's screwing up all of those things. And severing all four hydraulic lines. A photograph actually was taken from the ground, confirmed that the vertical stabilizer was missing. God. The pilot set their transponder to broadcast a distress signal, and air traffic control uh, directed the emergency landing to be at Nagoya Airport, which was just about over halfway to Osaka, which is where they were going. Um, but <laughs> Captain Takahama was like, "No, f- that we can't do that. Like, this this <laughs> shit's totally broken. We gotta go. We gotta go back." So he was trying to turn the plane around to go back to Haneda, but that's when they lost control of the plane completely. Hydraulic fluid completely drained resulted in loss of hydraulic control and non-functional control surfaces. Plus the lack of stabilizing influence from the vertical stabilizer, which was gone, the aircraft be- began this up and down oscillation in a fugoid cycle. So it's fucking Bronco, exactly. Oh, it had to be an absolute joy for right? the passengers. Oh my God. Just praying and praying and screaming and praying. They were doing everything they could to try to get control, like lowering the landing gear, the flaps interfered with control by the throttle. To try to like create drag. Correct. Yeah, and but the control of it completely deteriorated. Upon descending to thirteen thousand five hundred feet, the the pilots reported an uncontrollable aircraft. Heading over the Izu Peninsula, the pilots turned towards the Pacific Ocean, then back towards the shore. They descended below 7,000 feet before returning to a climb. So they were just going up and down and oh. up and down and all over the place. Um, the aircraft reached 13,000 feet before entering an uncontrollable descent into the mountains and disappearing from radar at 6.56 p.m. So they took off at 6.12 12. and they disappeared from radar at 6.56 p.m. So these guys were holding like 12 minutes into that flight. They were trying to control this plane for that long. That's, I mean, just the the amount of effort. Because when you look at the plane's controls, there's just so much going on. And so to try to wrestle that sort of machinery when it's fighting against you, it's and, just got to be a nightmare. Oh, yeah. And especially being a veteran, just being like, there's not everything yeah. that I know. Yeah, I've tried I've, I've everything tried possible. Everything that, uh, there's nothing. And you, if you look actually at the map, they have it tracked. They were all over the place. Like but the plane was going one way, and then it was east, and then it was south, and then it was north. I wonder if then... it's visible from the ground, because people had to be, like, flipping out seeing that. 20-something minutes? Like, after that explosion, 12 minutes in, or, or whatever so happened at with 624, that repair? At 624, this is when the plane lost control. That's when the vertical stabilizer blew. So, and then they lost contact with the plane at 656, at about 6,000 feet. Or about 7,000 feet. Careening through. Mm-hmm. How... Probably felt like a day and a half. Oh, yeah. 
I guess it wasn't at cruising altitude, but it, it will. No, they were at cruising altitude. When, Twelve minutes in, yeah. yeah. So they were at cruising altitude, going five hundred miles per hour when something snapped, and then they kept it going for thirty-two minutes yep. until it finally hit that zero elevation. Yes, I and know. that's that takes skill. Oh, Absolutely, pros. they did the best they could with what they had. I mean. Who knows? It could have gone down way faster with anyone who was less experienced than they were. But would that have been better? Yeah, I know, right? That's the thing. Maybe. It's really horrible to think about. It's like, would that if it's going to go down either way, do you want it to happen in five minutes or 35 minutes? Well, here's you know? the thing. You, um, and, and maybe it would have been better because in the final moments, the wing clipped a mountain ridge, plunged again. The plane then slammed into a second ridge and then flipped and landed on its back. So it didn't have a nice landing at yeah. all. Yeah. The aircraft's crash point was at an elevation of 5,135 feet. Egg Magnuson of Time Magazine said that the area where the aircraft crashed was referred to as the Tibet of the Gunma Prefecture. Not the place. Jesus. So it's Not kind of known as land. the Big Mountain Range. Um, and yeah. everybody, it's so easy to get to Tibet. Right. <laughs> what do you think easily traveling? You think Tibet? I know three friends have gone. <laughs> so, so this affects you know the the rescue efforts yeah. when it's in uh, rocky terrain like that, very very hostile terrain. Um, casualties reported of the crash included all 15 crew members uh, uh. and 505 of the 509 passengers. So only four people survived. People Jeez. survived. Yeah. People survived. Four people this. made it out of that Jesus. nightmare. The sad thing is that um, some passengers actually did survive the initial crash, but then died of their injuries hours later. Hours. Sad hours later. Well, you're laying into bed. God, laying in. Japanese Tibet dying of exposure of, of, ex- of a plane crash. Like what happened? I'm, I got plane crashed, so I, got plane I, need, help. I need help. And you didn't finish the job, <laughs> so <laughs> Tibet's gonna go ahead and take yeah. care of it, take for, care me of now. it for me. Strong people, but yeah, it's mostly they died because of the delays of the rescue operation, and uh, it remains the deadliest single aircraft accident. The thing is that the Air Force, the United States Air Force, was in the area. And at the Yokota Air Base, and they had been monitoring the distressed aircraft calls. So they were actually maintaining contact with the flight. And then after losing track on radar, the Air Force um, was asked to search for the missing plane. So, and they actually were the first to spot the crash site 20 minutes after impact. Mm. While it was still daylight. So remember, this was in August, and this was at six, it was at seven o'clock o'clock when they crashed. And the thing where it is in latitude, this is like pretty late in summer, so so they did have some time. Um, however, the American uh, the Air Force did offer an assistance to recover the crash, but they were actually told to stand down, and that the Japanese self defense forces were going to take care of it. So like the U.S. This. found it within 20 minutes. They were like, "We can try to get down there to help," and Japan was like, "No, we got this. Don't worry about it." And like Politics. stand down. Yeah, maybe they had that, like, a... They had a safe face. Safe face, yeah. Um, A a Japan Self-Defense Force helicopter did spot the crash. And, however, the pilot said that there were no signs of survivors. So, basically, they were like, let's just set up some base camp and wait out till the morning. We can go in and check everything out. (laughs) This seems so irresponsible. Yeah, they're all dead. They're all totally dead. Let's just, let's stop, have a snack. We'll take care of it in the morning. So they went up and set up some tents, like made some dinner. Like, Uh, we're going to get up in the morning and look at this Really, like, knock this plane crash thing out tomorrow, like, fresh, because today. (laughs) Just, I'm kind of, ah, you know, just a little achy, a little. It's uh, been a long one, man. It has. Sadly, medical staff found bodies with injuries suggesting that individuals had survived the crash oh, Jesus, only to die from shock exposure overnight in the mountains or from injuries that if tended to earlier would not have been fatal oh god one doctor said if the discovery had come 10 hours earlier we could have found more survivors 10 hours jesus so the the crazy thing was that there was an off-duty flight attendant on this flight and she is actually one of the four survivors and she said that um, from her hospital bed that she was reporting that she recalled bright lights after the crash, the sound of helicopters, af- and uh, shortly after she awoke, and she was amid the wreckage, and she could hear screaming and moaning from the other survivors, <sighs> and these sounds gradually died away during the night. Oh, that's sad. But seeing the helicopters being, yeah, and then right. being like, okay, where'd they go? And is someone making dinner up there? To think that you have hope, and then... Stay tuned for more Fort Fritz on Real Radio 104.1.
Fort Fritz on Real Radio 104.1. Welcome back to the final segment of Fort Fritz. We end with a little bit of levity. We, you know, Halloween is, is still also about fun and not just the macabre and the spooky. So here's Kaz's tale of El Hombre Caiman. Again, just download that iHeartRadio app and search Fort Fritz Campfire Tales. Well, you guys ever hear of Hombre Caiman? No, Hombre Caiman. How do you spell Hombre it? Hombre Caiman. Caiman would be uh, the Cayman, which is the uh, a, a species of South American like alligator. Yeah. It's got a really long snout. Yeah, right. but would Hombre be H O M B R E? Hombre, correct. Hombre. H O H O M B R E. So, and then C A I M A N. C A I M A N. Correct. Man Gator. Roughly translated into Man Gator or Gator Man. Ooh. Gator Man. 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 He's the best gator of the men. Gator Man. Gator Man. There's actually a really cool um, Barranquillo song um, that some older uh, what? Colombian Barranquillo yeah, style is, of uh, style of Spanish music. Well, okay. we can, we'll, we'll try to find it. Uh, so the the legend of Hombre Caiman starts in uh, Colombia off the Magdalena River oh. um, in a city called Plato. That sounds sexy. Um, mm. And city is probably loosely uh, used here. It's pro- more of a village. There are several different versions of the Hombre Caiman story. And he, uh, like this, what I'm assuming this lifeguard was, isn't necessarily an evil character. The, there's not a lot of uh, malevolence, even though it seems like half alligator, half man thing would be evil as but um, <laughs> sure. it's, it's more of Slightly a slightly evil at least it's more of a touching love story really uh, um, there again there are several different versions of the myth but my favorite one um, and I'm reading from it would be really terrifying for like gators to have like human legs because isn't that the whole thing about gators you can kind of outrun them if you can yeah. but if yeah. like yeah. Yeah. Human legs, like, yeah. I'm like yeah the so pictures the, of this dude he's built it's is, the is, front the, or the back? is the front half of this thing a human or is the back half of this thing a human seriously is it just like change it up that's a valid question or maybe it's like straight down the middle that's also because that would be really weird a bilateral alligator with a serious on the ground trying to figure out the distance like a human body but with like alligator legs yeah this is us Tell us about this ombre yeah. time. Okay, so, um, well, so where was I? I was, I was going to say the, the name of the book that I'm reading from. So, uh, in this uh, this excerpt or this this version of the tale that I got from uh, a book by Luis Fernando Arango and his wife Catherine Arango, they they have a version of the ombre Caman story that I thought was more uh, fleshed out. So uh, the story goes that a young woman named Rukalida, she was a beautiful young woman in the village, and there was a guy who would, it was basically like a traveling medicine man. He was a curandero, which was a guy who traveled, traveled the land, found weird stuff, and sold it to various people. So he would go find, you know, exotic fruits and medicines and things like that. So uh, the the curanderos were always they were they were traveling around and um, you know going from place to place, meeting different tribes and, and villages, and taking their their potions and their medicine, and selling it around. So he met this this lovely young woman in town and fell in love with her, and she fell in love with him. Uh, but their love was forbidden because the uh, the parents of Rocalinda or Rocalina. Uh, she, uh, they, they didn't approve because this guy was like a transient traveling, like, you know, like who the hell is this guy, right? Like he's so not, they're he's transient a phobic. Yeah. He's, right, a, yeah. he's a gypsy. They're xenophobic. They're, yeah. Xenophobic. He's a gypsy. He's yeah. He was, he they, didn't seem trustworthy. The right? Romeo and Julietting it. So, um, they forbid, they forbid them to see each other. They took her away. Then the legend goes that he continued to travel around the area and found a potion from a local tribe that allowed him to change into an alligator. The sexiest and most romantic of animals. <laughs> uh, the reason that he was going to employ this potion was because he had found that his beloved uh, had a certain bathing spot in the river that she really liked, and he would go uh, to meet her there. And uh, so that no one would recognize them, he would paint himself with this alligator potion and create and create make himself look like an alligator. But he also had the antidote which allowed him to turn himself back into a man. So this went on for a while. What the hell? 
That's crazy. <laughs> we got so many issues with this story. Yeah. No, it's just yeah. like, is he going to try to become an alligator and rape her or like be like, oh, it's no, not me. It's, it's, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's I mean, love. like, yeah. man, at what point is he going to change it? Because you see the alligator coming for you, you're not going to be like, oh, I hope that's my, my betrothed or so something. So the way I look at you it know? is like he did alligator head and just kept that part over, over the, the water, water and then just had like sexy man body underneath, you know, and then you go to her and then. You've really thought this out. Well, yeah, there's there's <laughs> pictures if you want to look them up online. Like, you can check it out. This dude's, like, ripped. Is there an age gate you have to click on? <laughs> it probably should be for one of these, yeah. Let's just say this, okay? Uh, if you were an alligator, mm-hmm. would you kind of, like, approach it as, like, the sexy alligator and then you turn into the human? A little coy? Or would you turn it up? Would no. you, like, turn up as a human and then be like, yeah, everything's cool because I'm a Alligator! No, that's right. the least sexy. Ambush dating. Ambush, ambush dating. Angela well, says ambush. Yeah. What do you say next, Brad? I, I say uh, that's not the issue at all. I see that he has the antidote, so he's going to swim up like a gator or a crocodile and then like kind of gesture the to the short little stubby hand that's too far away from his too big mouth to pour that antidote in and try and convince them with sign language somehow to make them back into a man so they can make sweet, sweet love. How does he show that he's like... The person though, does he just like right. does he just like bump his butt up in the water like eh, it's just point me. out a little it's bottle me. grip it's between me. two yeah. toes? <laughs> I feel like she would know. Like they're in love. Like she can tell his gator face right. from the other like gator natural, natural gators. I, I know that gator I can face tell, anywhere. I can tell. I can tell your gator face. You just go. That was beautiful. Damn, that gator's wearing some slacks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might see the indentation of a yeah, wallet. He's, gator. he's wearing some chubbies. Yeah, yeah. some pleated dockers. If I have to choose between the two, I feel like I don't ever turn into the alligator during sex, just because I don't know that During that's... sex? No, that's not the question. That's, well, not, that's, right. <laughs> that's not the question. Why would you turn into the gator mid- during coitus, sex? You're just like, No! Just, I let me just say Why this. not try it out one time? Uh, see how she feels Angela. about it. Please, Cass, proceed. And again, the, the, the myth goes in different ways. We can uh, He either has the bottom half of a man or the top half of a man and vice versa with, with the alligator parts. So. Or just a dude with a tail. That's weird. That's a, that'd be weird. That'd be weird. Oh, that'd all. be actually yeah. kind of awesome. I definitely want to see the bottom. You could swim really fast. Yeah, hell yeah, you could. Man, the, the tail is what propels them. They were able to live pretty much happily ever after. Uh, until one day he accidentally dropped the vial that contained the antidote Body halfway, th- halfway through uh, changing himself back into a man. Uh, so he wasn't able to fully transform to fully transform anymore. So he had to keep the, uh, and again, the legend uh, flips, flops. flips here, but yeah. uh, it was either his head or the bottom half. And, it, it turns out that Rokalina was so in love with him that she didn't care uh, that he had Aww. a gator head or a gator Aww. gator nuts or whatever. That, that is love. Be. Gator nuts. Gator is nuts. love. <laughs> Open Hashtag. for gator nuts in Tampa. Did they have kids and she laid like a batch of eggs? That's like, like maybe like how platypuses started like way back in the day. Could be. But here, here's, I, I, got, I have to interject that more realistically when you think about it, would it be if the top half or the bottom half, he would just be an in-between human gator hybrid like horrible monster. That is I correct. mean just like uh, like like semi-human with claws and bumpy skin, it wouldn't be like top half, bottom like half. The it dude would just from, be like in uh, between. Batman, uh, Killer Croc. Yeah, ah. it's like Killer Croc. Something like that. But wasn't there a Cajun uh, big crocodile, like anthropomorphic crocodile in Ninja Turtles? Yes, it was, was, it was called like Big Croc or something. Yeah, this is like very big crocodile. Big crocodile. This guy's called always some Gator Cajun Man. stereotype. Yeah. yeah, this one's called what? Kaiman. Ombre Kaiman. Ombre Kaiman. So Gator Man. Correct. Um, and in the city of, of Plateau on that river, they still honor the Ombre Kaiman. Uh, there's a festival for him. And I, th- I believe the custom is um, they eat, and this sounds awesome. This sounds rad as shit. We might be able to do this. It's like a weird fried cheese and coconut rice. Okay. Oh, and they, yeah, yeah, fried yeah. Cheese. they eat this uh, because it was his favorite meal, and it's what he used to watch. He used to eat and watch her bathe before he had the idea of <laughs> yeah, yeah. into a. Uh, into an alligator. We've all been there. Oh yeah, that, coconut you know, rice and fried cheese, and, and just turning like, yourself into an alligator. Just sad, like sitting on the beach, like oh. <laughs> eating wow. it off his belly like an otter. <laughs> that <don't laughs> <stress me>. yeah. <laughs> Hey, honey, it's Friday night. The kids are in bed. What do you want to do? I want to eat some fried cheese and coconut, coconut rice, rice while you bathe, and I watch you. It's so, <laughs> so sexy. And I pretend like yeah. I'm alligator. And I gave myself to be called before I turn into a crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. We've been married 28 years. <laughs> it keeps the spark alive. 
Reptile uh, file. And so, yeah, that's that's Ombre Come On. So- Have a very happy and safe Halloween weekend. And from all of us here at Fort Fritz, we will see you next week. You're listening to Real Radio 104.1. Until next time, pleasant dreams.